previously on Zoom In. See, the Roman authorities were like, they're both the same. So now you have to pick which zealot you want to see free. Now, Jesus was a revolutionary. I want to make the connection here. Jesus was a revolutionary, but not like Barabbas, who believed, this is what Barabbas believed, and many of the zealots at that time, they believed um, that, they, that they were called to fight, fight for God so that God can rule. Whereas Jesus the revolutionary was like, no, 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 I'm going to die. Because I am God and I am ruling. What a, what a revolutionary, what a way of thinking. But again, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. So we have the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Zealots, now the final group, the Essenes. Welcome Rooted Fellowship family, one and all. A special welcome to our guests who are visiting us on this platform. We're so happy that you could join us today. My name is Tsepo Kotura Mabo, and I will be your host for today, helping you navigate through our service. To tell you a little bit about us, we are about three things. We are gospel-centered, disciple-making, and transcultural. Just to elaborate on one which is disciple making as the gospel seeks to transform the individual life of a person we want to see a multiplying effect of this in the lives of others and we believe that this can be best done by the making of disciples at this moment we'd like to take some time to thank all those who generously give their time their talent and their resources also to appeal to those who do not yet give we ask that you would prayerfully consider doing so. And should you seek more information as to how to do this, I'd like to direct you to our website, which is rootedfellowship.com for further information. Remember that we give because we have received from God and that this is an act of worship. Rooted Fellowship is a praying church. At this moment, we're going to transition into a time of prayer. A slide will come up before you with different points of prayer that we're going to ask you to pray over. You're more than welcome to press pause and pray for anything over and above than what you see before you. So let us pray.
Hey everyone, it's Oni here. We are in part six of our sermon series that we've titled Zoom In, The Mission of the Church. Now it's been an incredible series and if you've missed out on any of them, I want to encourage you to go back and listen to them. They're really going to set you up for what we're going to do over these next two weeks. We are going to spend some time looking at some tangible, uh, practical, how do I then share my faith? How how, uh, do I ensure that I am being obedient to the mission that God has given to us? The great commission, not the great suggestion, but the great commission. And we're going to do that by having a conversation with two of our church planters that we are sending out, Lord willing, in 2021. Now, 2020 has been a crazy year, but it has not stopped the mission of God. And so while maybe we have slowed down and just kind of taken some time to see uh, how everything is going to unfold, we have kept our eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith. And we have said yes to the mission of God because it does not change. Now, before we have our first church planter uh, sit down and just kind of unpack what he's hoping and trusting God to do through him and the team that is around him, let me uh, quickly remind you uh, what uh, this is all about, where we started our series, the fact that, that just as Jesus was sent, so are we. Our text Anchor text, uh, for lack of better words, has been Luke chapter 4, uh, particularly verses 18 and 19. This is Jesus announcing his ministry. He's telling the people why he has come. And then before that, he actually unpacks who he is. But I'm going to read from verse 17. This, he had, was in the synagogue and had gotten a scroll, the scroll of Isaiah, and had just read from it, right? And in there, in there is jam-packed with who Jesus is and what his mission is. And from there, we're able to pull out what it is that we've been called to. And so verse 17, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and unrolling the scroll, he found a place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me, anointed me to be set apart, to be consecrated for an office or or service, chosen. And we saw that all of this comes with blessing, protection, and empowerment. And so Jesus uh, had been anointed. So have we. But let me keep reading. He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus is announcing that the Messiah is here and that his ministry is now underway. We also saw in the first week uh, that, that Jesus actually details who he has come for. He tells us uh, the four classes of people who would benefit from his ministry. We see it in the text. It's the poor, the captives, the blind, and the oppressed. Uh, These categories powerfully portray the people whom Christ came to save. Let me unpack them real brief because we're going to jump into them and make them practical in a moment. So uh, Jesus was anointed to preach good news to the poor. Now the word poor can cover poverty of every kind, which would excuse many of us at Rooted Fellowship, because to a large extent, we don't consider ourselves uh, poor. In fact, this word here speaks of of poverty, great poverty. And so, yes, we might be going through some tough times, but we should be careful not to label ourselves as those who are in poverty. So don't check out. Don't go, hey, this is not about me. Uh, I want us to know that here Jesus is referring to not just physical, but he's also referring to spiritual poverty. That those who are separated from God are spiritually bankrupt. So the poor. Likewise, the captives uh, has a spiritual application because the word technically means prisoners of war. Uh, No prisoners were attached to the congregation that Jesus had just read this to. And so yet we must realize that those who were separated from God were spiritually in bondage. 
bondage to money, bondage to guilt, bondage to sex, bondage to hatred and success and food and unforgiveness. The list goes on and on and on. That all in the prison house of sin, the truth about Jesus' ministry allows us to sing the, the great song, Amazing Grace, because we recognize what Jesus has done for us. The third group that was to benefit from Christ's ministry and continues to benefit from Christ's ministry is the blind. He came to bring recovery of sight to the blind. That those who have yet to know the saving grace of Jesus are considered spiritually blind. That they, that they don't recognize, they don't see that they are in desperate need of a savior. And then lastly, Jesus came to set free the oppressed. Now the core idea of oppressed here is, is to be broken into pieces, to be shattered, to be crushed. And so Jesus comes to those squashed by life's circumstances, to those who feel like there is no way out. They've come to the end of their rope, that they've gone everywhere they can, hoping to find life and meaning, but they come up empty. Jesus says, I've come to give you freedom. Now, Jesus didn't just say these things, but he did them. He walked on earth and he put into practice what he preached. We can look through the Gospels and see that, that, that Jesus is going from place to place, not only preaching the good news, but he's engaging the people. Now, why? Why would he do this? Well, it's because he's the savior of the world. He's the savior of the world. He's the Messiah sent by God anointed by the Holy Spirit. And so as we see this in the life of Jesus, we should recognize that we are to do the same, that we are sent by Him. We are anointed by the Holy Spirit. In fact, we have the Holy Spirit living in us. He blesses us. He protects us. He empowers us to do that which God has called us to do. Now, in the first week, I made mention of the fact that there's two misuses of this text. Uh, the one is limiting poverty, brokenness, oppression, and injustice to physical and social states only. It's to say, no, 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 this, this passage only refers to, 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 to the spiritual reality. And that is true. Look, it does. It speaks to our spiritual reality. But it does so much more. The second mistake that we make is making no effort to relieve physical and social poverty, brokenness, oppression, and injustice. It's to simply say, we just preach the gospel and that's it. Because the, the spiritual is what is important. And yes, it is. But the gospel doesn't stop there. That it has tentacles that makes its way into the various spaces of our society in our neighborhoods, in our places of work, with our friends and our family. So we should not make that mistake. We preach the gospel and we engage. The gospel is both and. And we can see this in the life of Jesus. And so just as Jesus was sent, Jesus then sends us. We see this in John 17, verse 18. And if you remember, we go... In our sentness, we go with authority and expectation. Uh, the authority that comes from Jesus, not our own. Our, author our own authority can, can do nothing. We need Jesus' authority, but we also go with expectation. That we've been sent, that there is a harvest that is plentiful. We're told that the issue is the laborers. The laborers are few, and so we pray. We pray for the laborers. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out the laborers. And so we pray as Rooted Fellowship that God would send us out. Not just as a local church in the context that we find ourselves in, but, but we also send out leaders. We send out groups to go start more churches. And you might say to me, but, but why? There's no Bible 
verse that says, go plant churches. You're right. But, but, but we believe that, that one of the best ways to fulfill and be obedient to the Great Commission is to plant healthy churches that will have healthy believers who go into the various contexts of our society with the good news of the gospel to preach and to make known the wonder of who God is so that people might see that they're in desperate need of a Savior. And so that's what this series has been about. We've been zooming into this text, seeking to understand what our mission is as the church. And if you are a Christian, if you've crossed the line of faith, then you should know that you are a part of the church. And so therefore, you should have that aroma of sentness. And so I want us to chat a little bit to our church planters. And, and so today, we're going to chat to uh, Reino Mayer, who's looking to plant uh, an incredible church uh, in Centurion. And we're going to chat a little bit about uh, what he's looking to do, what his heart is for that area, and then chat a little bit about what are some ways uh, that we might learn from him to be salt and light where we live, work, and play. And so let's uh, head over to our conversation with Reno Mayer. Hey, everyone. As promised, uh, to my right is Reno Mayer. He's a church planting resident uh, looking to plant an incredible church come 2021. Um, but I'll let him share a little bit about that. But, uh, but before we do that, not everyone knows you. And so maybe just uh, by way of introduction, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's really good to be back in studio today. Uh, like Ona said, my name's Reno. I'm married to Marie. We have two beautiful daughters. I've been in ministry for quite some time, for a guy that's 35 years old, but in my last three years, uh, I was doing a church planting residency uh, at Rupert Fellowship. Before that, I was a congregational reverend, like proper job, Afrikaans Germany, really. And then at the end of 2017, my wife and I were convinced that church planting is what lies ahead for us. So 2018, 2019, and whatever this year will be called, at the end of this year, uh, we spent this church plant residence at Rupert Fellowship. Brilliant, brilliant. Thanks, thanks for sharing. And uh, and like I said, uh, we're going to spend these next two weeks, and so today with Reino, and then next week with our other church planting resident, Sitle. And really, we just want to get into the nitty gritty of what it means to be obedient to the mission that God has given the church. And as Christians, we are a part of that church, and so that mission is for us as well. Uh, so we want to talk a little bit about how it plays itself out in our everyday lives. And so maybe with that, uh, let me ask the question. You, you're, you're looking to plant a church in Centurion. Uh, you're taking a group of people who are going to go with you and your wife and your two kids. Um, talk to us a little bit about that experience, uh, uh, why you feel the call to do that, uh, and then talk to us a little bit about the church plant, and then talk to us about the area that you're looking to plant this church in. Okay. Loaded questions, mate, so I might take some time. Uh, so the area where we're going to plant in Centurion is known as Behuvus, or we can actually call it Centurion CBD if we want to. Now, that area is filled with people like us in terms of age and in terms of season of life. It's also an area that has a lot of clustered housing, which means in terms of the house market that it is affordable housing close to uh, main veins and freeways. And also ideally situated between Pretoria, Midrand and Johannesburg. You know, it sounds like I'm pitching property, but I'm not actually. That just means that it's a really attractive place for people like us to come and stay. Now, what we find in that area is people like us, like I've just said, uh, uh, that I've just said, who live lives that is pretty much all work and no play. And lives that even though we live in close proximity to one another, we do live in isolation. You know, you can imagine if you hustle a day job, wanting to build a career, wanting to move forward in life, having kids, trying to establish your lives and put down roots, you know, that takes up a lot of the hours of your day. Mm -hmm. So what we saw in that area is uh, people of our age living amongst other people, but very much alone. And I mean, for us, believing that we were created for community, you know, something has to be done about that. And also what we saw is that is the fastest diversifying area in Centurion. So obviously Centurion is made up of, you know, a lot of different zones, proper jobs, suburbia, clustered housing, commercial properties, etc. Now, obviously in suburbia, you know, you find people staying for longer, more established in their lives, whereas with clustered housing and apartment buildings, you find a more transient community, you know, people coming in and moving out. So what we saw in that area of Centurion 
is a, a quickly diversifying area without a church community that reflects the diversity of that area. The church that is also sending me out in partnership with Rooted Fellowship is called, this is a tongue twister, Pierre van Reineveld Geloofsfamilie. Perfect for a guy that speaks Afrikaans, uh, but we just call that PVR or PVR if you want to. So um, that church is situated in Centurion. There are many other churches in Centurion, not only even from the same denomination, but of various denominations. Well-known churches with big names, with multi-campuses, they're all present in Centurion. Mm -hmm. But what we saw was in that area that's so quickly diversifying, we don't see a diverse church. And if you want to reach an area with a church, I believe that the church should look like the area, right? I'm not talking about you know, immorality and sin. I'm just talking about season of life and people that I can identify with. Someone else also walking the kids in the street with a stroller. Someone else also going, man, tough day at work, kind of, you know, clutching the telephone while you buy your stuff at Spar on your way home, still closing the deal, you know. Mm -hmm. If you find someone that looks like you, connection with that person is easier. So that's what really awakened in our hearts is to go, we can add something to the church landscape in Centurion if we plant this church right in this place mm -hmm. for two reasons. The one is that we were created for community. So living in an area that has about 13,000 people, but feeling alone, there's something wrong with that, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And then secondly, it is an area that fuels this understanding that success and fulfillment and, you know, the good life is to be found in money and careers. Mm -hmm. You know, people would often say in that area where we want to plant, uh, we are living here for now, you know, as if an uh, apartment that has got two bathrooms and, uh, you know, the two bedrooms and one bathroom, that's really not what you want. You know, you want something a little bigger. So this is only like a tent solution. Um, and, and it just fuels that whole narrative of I want to move forward in life. I should hustle harder. I should grind harder. If you want something done, do it yourself. You know, don't trust anyone. Uh, make a life for yourself. Keep on going. And uh, that is counterintuitive to a life saturated by the grace of God, uh, living day by day from His provision, living sacrificially, living unselfish, living for the others. You know? So we need to establish community there that lives a totally different narrative. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, when people go, what are you guys all about? What? Why are you so weird? Like, I like you, but dude, you are weird. You're different. And that's why we felt called to go and establish the community. Man, that's, that's incredible. That's uh, uh, what I like to say, just nuggets. I feel like you gave us nugget after nugget after nugget, and it's all good things. Um, and, and I can hear uh, just that, that missional language coming from you. Uh, we, we had a sermon where we referred or went to the text and saw that God actually calls us ambassadors, that we are ambassadors of the kingdom of God. Um, and there's a lot to be said about that. But but even hearing you now, I'm hearing the language of missionary, mm -hmm. that you're seeing yourself and you're seeing that community that wants to go into this area as missionaries. And what one of the things that missionaries do is they understand the context that they're going into. They, they really want to understand it. They want to uh, know the concerns of the people there. They, they, they want to know the, the, the idols. Uh, you know, what do people really, really cling to hoping to find life and meaning in? And Because it just makes you a better missionary. Mm -hmm. You're not going in quickly, checking what's going on, throwing out a few pamphlets and then leaving back to wherever you come from. You're going, no, we want to move in. Um, it's this idea or, or this theology of dwelling, which I love a lot. Yeah. Um, but, but let's press into that a little bit more. Um, hey, did you mention the name of your church, the church uh, plant? I did not. Oh, there we go. We shall be called Fellowship City. There we go. Uh, Fellowship family, yeah, by the way. For those who aren't sure or wondering why. Um, and if you want more information about where that name comes from and why, please feel free to reach out uh, to Reino. He's got an incredible story there. Um, but let me press in a little bit and ask the question, wh what does is, what is a missional lifestyle actually look like? You know, it's, it's two words that we use quite often, uh, but do we really understand what that means? And so maybe speak to us about uh, what does is, what is a missional lifestyle look like for Reino Mer? How is he salt and light? Uh, where he lives, work, yeah. and plays. So I'm going to drop this one. You might have heard the word before. But a missional life is an intentional life. Mm. Okay? Many different ways to describe mission. I mean, uh, uh, evangelism is also mission. Uh, ecumenical church or church with others, that's also mission. Um, inculturation, you know, taking the gospel into a culture and having the culture wrestle with the truth of the gospel, that's also mission. I believe that for us, 
uh, as people call to plant this church, missional, a missional life is an intentional life. And here's what I mean when I say intentional. If we use what God has given to us, okay, ears, mouths, hands, and hearts, I mean, I carry them with me all the time. And we think about how this can be used to herald the good news, to be a witness to Christ, to be salt and light, to bring healing to the world. Then all of a sudden, your life goes from mission every now and then, maybe haphazardly, to 24 hours a day. I am intentional about how I listen. I'm intentional about how I speak. I'm intentional about how I use my hands to help real quick. I'm focused every single minute of my day, whether that is at home, chatting to the neighbors, in SPAR, on my way to work, using public transport, working out of the gym, coin some balls at the Action Cricket Club, whatever it is that you do. I am intentional about what I do with God, with what God has given me. So if you ask me what our own mission or rhythms is, now this is Reino Meyer speaking, married to Marie with two daughters, not the let me cast a vision for a church plant I know because I can also switch into that mode. But I mean, for us, that would mean listening to people intentionally and remembering details of what they do share with you. Because that can be used in a next conversation or a next engagement. That's something as simple as remembering a name or something as simple as remembering a small detail. So as an example, when you chat to your neighbor and your neighbor says things are going really rough at work, you might not always have the opportunity to have a really long conversation about why, but just remember that detail. Because the next time you engage with your neighbor, the question might be, so how was work today? And he or she might even go, dude, did you follow me? And you might go, no, no, I just remember last week you said you had an absolute minute at work. All of a sudden, there's something different about you. And it's really only listening more intently, you know, than someone going, man, I had a real ripper at work. Yeah, 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 I know what you mean, man. Cool, have a good night. And that guy goes, I don't actually know if he knew or if he heard what I said, you know. It's something like speaking, um, being friendly with people, uh, asking questions, asking questions that show uh, interest. Now, I mean, the obvious uh, example would be asking someone's name. But for me personally, you know, it would mean making an observation and remembering it so that I can ask again the next time, you know. Let's go back to the neighbor scenario, because I really do think that even in the area that we're going to plant, your neighbor is right next to you. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one of those areas. You also live in a complex. That's what makes complex living so awesome, mm -hmm. is you can actually approach the front door of your neighbor. You actually hear the boot go, go, go you know, when they get home, uh, instead of big suburban yards where you don't hear anything. You know, you just hear the gate rolling open and then rolling shut again. So, you know, asking a question like, uh, you said that you really, really miss your kids. Um, I actually don't know how many kids you guys have. I actually don't know where they are and why you say that you miss them. Would you mind telling me more? Who would not like to share a little bit of their story? You know, and that's just asking a good question. And I'm not saying that you should, you know, snoop around spying on your neighbors the whole time. But a simple conversation like, I saw you guys rolling in with a whole, you know, stack of furniture on the back of your bucket last week. Uh, what was that all about? You know, and creating relationship in that way. If you just think about hands, man, uh, offering help, uh, even if it is carrying shopping bags, even if it is hoeing some topsoil on the lawn, uh, even if it is, can I drop that off for you? Can I take out your bin? Can I bring back your bin? Mm -hmm. That's what mission of life looks like mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. Because there's a connection with a human being on the other side of that every single mm -hmm. time. And the more connection you build with someone, the easier it is to share the gospel, mm -hmm. And the easier it is to create spaces for that person to ask, why on earth would you bring back my trolley bin, you know? Mm -hmm. Or why on earth would you offer help? Is that not going to be a, a massive inconvenience for you? And then only to say, no, it's not at all. I would love to help you. You know, that's what mission life looks like for us. Mm -hmm. Together with that, uh, I would say hospitality. Having people over sitting around your table, that was probably the biggest challenge for me of 2020, is I love having people around my table. Yeah. And we just couldn't do it, you know? Don't know how many Zoom dinners you had or you had. We had a few of them, but man, they, they got old. Yeah. They really did get old. Because, I mean, you, you chow your scoff in five or seven minutes and then you sit and stare at the screen, you know. It's so uncomfortable. But hospitality, um, 
why did we have this conversation over a cup of coffee? I would love to brew for you. You know, I mean, obviously, you have to serve in black coffee societies, Kenyan espresso, be just putting that out there. But, you know, hospitality, um, uh, bringing people into your house uh, and giving them the ability to see what your life is like. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of our easiest ways to, to testify or to be a witness towards mm -hmm. the gospel mm -hmm. or towards people of the gospel. And those are those are really really good. And again, it's uh, I'm, I am literally sitting uh, at, at, in front of a fire hydrant and just receiving so much goodness. Like the stuff that you're saying is so practical and so good. I mean, just three things that 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 I like took in my head, like a mental note. Um, I just kept hearing the word inconvenience, inconvenience, inconvenience. And my heart wanted to go, yeah, I don't want to do that because that's a massive inconvenience to me, right? Like I, I don't want to go out of my way. Um, but if I have an eternal uh, perspective, if I have, if I'm, uh, have the kingdom of God in my mind, then hey, I'm willing to be inconvenienced for five minutes to get an opportunity to potentially share Jesus. It, that's five minutes I'm willing to like, okay, I, I want to do away with that because what I gain is, is so, so big. Um, so I heard that and then intentionality is such a big thing. Um, you know, when I, I think I can hear a lot of people saying, uh, well, you know, how, how, how do I become intentional? It feels like such a big step to take. Um, one of the things that, that, that I used to do uh, pre COVID, um, but I'm definitely going to do now as you know, things open up and we can go to restaurants is, um, I would randomly sit at the table where I'm having a meeting with someone or eating a meal and, and the waiter or waitress comes over. Um, I would simply say to them once they've brought our food or our drinks to say, Hey, we're going to pray right now. We're going to pray for this food. And, and that's something that I, I always do. Mm -hmm. And I just say to them, Hey, is there anything that I can pray for you? Um, and and it, I know it's it, it sounds weird asking that question, but we live in a context where people are still fairly religious, and, and so it might come as a surprise to go, oh, you you want to pray for me? But it's not like a what is prayer and what does that mean? And and I've been blown away by how much people actually open up when they're just shocked that someone actually cares, um, and the fact that you're willing to pray for them, and 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 it's just it's it's been great as I go back over and over again to be able to ask questions now, like hey, how's that? Yeah, situation going I've been praying for you um, so that's that's something that, that I picked up there and then the last thing is who would have ever thought that one of our greatest apologetics um, or our apologetic tools if you will would be kindness humility generosity hospitality right like in our minds when we think apologetics we think ooh thick textbooks and like exactly exactly and um and it's not to say that those things aren't important they're very very important we should know as much as we can yeah. um but a lot of people out there are just they're looking for kindness and gentleness and humility and generosity and hospitality and that actually can be a tremendous apologetic because then it leads to that question why would you do this um so great great stuff great stuff there Mate, can i just jump onto that and add one more i think that's really important for us in the south african context to understand that selfishness and individualism, my life is about myself, is far more rampant in a South African narrative mm. than hostility or rejection of mm. faith or religion. Mm. You know, we sometimes get influenced by first world, post, 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 post Christian countries to think that we cannot ask a waiter or waitress, can I pray for you? Mm. We're not allowed to say, I would like my God to bless you. Mm. In South Africa, we don't find that hostility towards someone wanting a conversation around faith and around life. Mm. What we much rather find in the context of South Africa is, I don't want to sacrifice for you anymore. Mm. You are causing me a inconvenience. And that's why I think that this kind of intentional life is a phenomenal way to get a foot in the door to share the gospel with people and to invite them into community mm. because that's what's the alternative narrative at this moment mm. you know the alternative narrative is not a life of faith leads to fulfillment and i would like to tell you about a god that wants to bless you i don't think anyone in south africa would go mm -mm, no stop that immediately mm. that's so weird people would go well okay tell me more mm. you know uh extending the hand or extending the elbow in south africa is a really easy way to create friendships yeah. but i think those kind of small ways uh, reverses this narrative of I live more and more selfish and I mean a word of exhortation to the church specifically you know for me and for us as a generation in this time is don't get caught up in the selfish way that everything we engage with wants us mm -hmm. to believe you know so even the advertisement that you watch on television of Gillette you know it's written 
so that you should believe that I need that more than anything else at this point in time, and I'm going to chase it. You know, that's how advertisement and PR works. You know, mm. and we shouldn't, as Christians, fall into that trap. So for me, uh, the verb that's used in the Great Commission is a continuous verb. So we just translate it as therefore go or go therefore. Mm -hmm. It actually, if you pass it out in its Greek context, it says as you go. You know, there's this continuous, act, continuous action. So for me, it's not about where should I find time in my day today to be missional. It's rather going, well, as I go to the gym, how can I do it? As I go to work, how can I do it? As I go do shopping, how can I do it? As I go wherever I go, how can I use this time to be intentional? Where can I say a friendly hello? Where can I strike up a conversation? Where can I pick up something and help someone? Then that also, all of a sudden, your day becomes an adventure, mate. That's when you get up in the morning and you go, oh, so expectant about what's going to happen today. Why are you so excited? Well, now I'm going to work. But yesterday was a rip, but, yeah. and I'm looking forward to what might happen today. Yeah. So good. So good. And even as you talk about sacrifice and, and living um, in a way that, that uh, puts on display humility and self-sacrifice, um, I, I, if you're looking for example, you know, we go to Jesus. Uh, Jesus is the clear example of what that actually looks like. And so maybe let's, let's go to Jesus um, because we, we live in a context where, where things are Things are challenging, to be honest. It's hard. It's hard to figure out, you know, what uh, what do I amen? What do I not? What am I against? What am I for? Um, as society continues to change and culture is always changing, um, as a Christian and as the church, we might find ourselves asking questions, okay, which side do I pick? Should I do this? Because uh, government's asking me to do this. Is this right? Is it not my uh, my my, uh, my my boss is uh, asking of this? And I don't know. I'm conflicted. There isn't like a clear thus says the lord do not do this you know how do i navigate through that and i want to take us to a piece of scripture uh, matthew 22 uh, where uh, jesus is asked this question so uh, a group of people show up to him and uh, it's the issue around taxes you know what do they do with taxes um, it's a really cool scene i wish i was there because i i imagine jesus kind of uh, chilled hanging back jesus is always chilled when i when i picture him and they bring him a coin and it's got you know caesar's face on it and they're like hey uh, so who are we supposed to you know, pay taxes to. And he's like, well, give me that coin. Let me see whose face is on it. Um, let me read his response to their question. And it's interesting, the groups of people that are present. So it's the Hero Herodians and the Pharisees who actually hated one another. They, they wouldn't agree on anything. You would never find them agreeing on anything. Yet here in this text, we actually see them partnering together because they're so against what Jesus has uh, in store for them. And, and so they ask the question um, and then Jesus goes, well, uh, this is verse 21, Matthew 22. Uh, well, then he said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. Now, another group of people with the zealots, they probably would have gone, what on earth is wrong with this guy? We give nothing but death to Caesar. We want nothing to do with the Roman Empire. And here is this guy calling himself the Messiah and saying, well, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. How do we reconcile that? Like, what does that mean for us today as we navigate uh, through a world where it feels like there are two sides to every coin? Yeah. Were you word playing there? Because Jesus actually picked up a coin. Just know? a little bit, just oh, a little bit. It is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so firstly, my nerd brain just absolutely exploded. Let me, let me say what I think this is all about, and then I'll, I'll give some comments. So I think the reason why we find it difficult in this day and age to navigate through these times is because we have a hard time determining our priorities, okay? You know that, man. That struggle is real. Every morning when we get up, every day as we receive messages, mails, calls, and, you know, you go through meetings and you go through tasks that's given to you, deadlines that has to be met, we are constantly prioritizing. But the fact that we are constantly doing it doesn't mean that we are actually nailing it, right? It's difficult mm. for us to determine what's best next. The second thing is our motives are also, you know, from here to there. Sometimes our motives are really pure and full of gospel intentionality, and other mm. times our, <laughs> our motives are just really poor, you know. And Christians always have hyena motives, you know, saying that, dude, I don't want to hurt you, but then I bite you, you know, when you when you walk away. Uh, a jackal also bites from behind, but a hyena is more deadly, you know. Um, so I, th I think our motives, being honest about them, understanding them, understanding why I am doing what I'm doing, why I'm saying what I'm saying, <laughs> why I'm longing for what I'm longing for. For us, it's, it's really difficult to discern those. And then I think loyalty. 
Mm. It's really hard for us to determine who am I going to be loyal to, mm. because loyalty presupposes relationship. Relationship pre presupposes sin and the fact that relationships can hurt me. Mm -hmm. And not only that, you know, the fact that I've given you loyalty and you hurt me, but also everything else is looking for our loyalty. Mm -hmm. Like a political party wants your loyalty. They mm -hmm. want your buy -in. Gillette also wants your loyalty because once you buy the five blade, fi uh, the, the five blade fusion, you'll never go back. You know, and like everything that we are confronted with every single day calls for loyalty. So I think Jesus' answer speaks towards priority, motives, and loyalty. Okay, so let's just unpack that for a bit. Um, the, the Herodians and the Pharisees, uh, they were two parties that believed that if the Roman Empire dispenses some patronage towards us, we have to find a way that we can kind of honor that so that the patronage will keep on coming. I mean, Herod the Great was a massive builder and architect. He was known as a Jew, but he was also known as an Edomian. So he didn't really come like from the stronghold of the Jewish people, which was Judea, the province. So he had to work to carry the favor of the Jewish people. So what did he do for them? He built them phenomenal buildings. And what did he do for the Roman Empire? Well, he built them phenomenal buildings. So on both sides, Herod the Great played this relationship of, listen, I'm giving the Caesar due honor because I'm making his place look nice. Mm -hmm. And to the Jewish people, he said, even though you might not accept me as one of your own, you're a little xenophobic towards me. I'm going to build you great buildings, which will also honor God, which will be, which will be where you are going to worship. Mm -hmm. That's what, uh, that was the temple that stood when Jesus was, um, you know, at this point actually in Jerusalem. It was Herod the Great's temple, the second temple was, Phenomenal building. I mean, it had a cornerstone of 380 tons. You know, it was huge. So he kept on cutting for the favor of the Roman Empire. The Pharisees obviously benefited from that, but they didn't want to be seen as we are playing for the favor of the Roman Empire. So the way that they kind of paid patronage to the Roman Empire was saying, thank you for allowing us our rules and our ways. We will keep to them and we will be really strict with them. Nothing else in this rule book will guide our lives. So, in a sense, they bowed to the Roman Empire. Now, obviously, that would cause a zealot to pull his hair from his head and go, what are you thinking? The Romans are nothing. God is everything. They don't own anything. God owns everything. So, everyone was looking, actually, for a reason or a justification of why they do what they do. This is background context. Sorry, hashtag Bible nerd. But they were looking for a justification of why they do what they do. So the one party obviously paid the taxes. And in this sense, it's uh, the Greek word kensos, which is where the Latin word census comes from, which is where we find the word census that we use in our general language as well. So it was normal taxes to be paid by everyone. It's called an imperial tax. It's levied on everyone and it's used for the administration and service delivery of the place. Mm -hmm. Was it misused? Obviously, is it still being misused today? Yes. <laughs> that way of government and power and having access, you know, to funds that stirs greed, that's a narrative as old as humankind. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so back to the story. So all of them were looking for justification of why they do what they do. So the one party said, we, we are paying it, so we say yes, and here's the reason. The other party said, we're looking for a justification of civil disobedience. We say no. And that's why they came to Jesus. Now, remember, at this point, Jesus is in Jerusalem. And he's dismantling this fortress of first century Judaism, showing them how he is the way rather than the way that they do it. That's why every single, season, every single scene in this part of Matthew it just gets hotter and hotter and hotter. Like very soon, Jesus will have probably the most harsh words he's ever spoken to the Pharisees in chapter 23. So he's busy showing them that their way is not the right way, but that his way is the right way. Okay, so now they come to him. I can also imagine him being chilled. And then they throw this absolute ripper of a question to him. If he says yes, he's in trouble because then he gets put in that box. If he says no, he's in trouble because then he gets put in that box. And neither of these boxes do the Roman Empire actually like. Okay, the people who pay them their taxes, they kind of live with it. The people who don't pay them their taxes, you know, they really want to nip that in the bud. So now Jesus offers 
this phenomenal answer. He says, he gets a coin. He says whose face is on the coin. And then he says, well, if this person's face is on the coin, then give it to him. Whose face is on you? And who do you belong to? Right? So Jesus picks up an Old Testament narrative of everyone created in the image of God. And if you carry the image of God, then you belong to God. If this coin carries the image of the emperor or Caesar, then it belongs to Caesar. And what Jesus says is, um, give to Caesar what is his, meaning pay the tax that is levied on you for the good of the community, because that's what it's being used for. But that doesn't mean that you belong to it. So if your motive is to curry favor by the authorities or from the authorities by paying your taxes, your motive is wrong. If you actually use paying taxes to declare your loyalty to the Roman Empire, you're also wrong. And then the reverse is also uh, the same. If you don't do it to try and show your motive or to try and show your priority or to try and show your loyalty, then you're also wrong. Mm. Here's what I need you to do. Pay it because it's his, but never submit to the empire as if they own you mm. because you belong to someone else. And in that, Jesus actually braces his followers to say that you might be really obedient citizens as a church, but you still might get persecuted. Mm. And that's exactly what happened in the book of Acts and in the early church. Mm. So for us, you know, if I have to give this verse specifically, some vitamin A, little application, hashtag Brian Loritz, he always uses that one. If I have to give this verse a little bit of uh, vitamin A for us, I would say that living a uh, civil, obedient lives is a good thing mm. at this point in time. And doing what is expected of us as citizens of the Republic of South Africa in this time is a good thing because it's for mutual benefit. But declaring loyalty to something else than Jesus Christ, to something else than His kingdom, having something else on your mind than repent and believe for the kingdom is near, I think that's where Jesus speaks to. Mm. So wanting to either not do what is expected of us from an unpure motive, or doing what is expected of us from an unfair motive. Mm. I think that's where Jesus would go, mm -mm -mm. keep these, these two things apart. Mm. There are things of this world, and these things of this world will never last. Mm. And then there's the kingdom of God. Mm. I called you in the beginning of the gospel of Mark to repent and to believe. Mm. That's what I need you to have in your minds. Mm. So, do what is expected of you, and give to Caesar what is his. Mm. But then know that your ownership and your own identity is rooted in something completely different. That's what I would say. Sure, man, that is so, so, so good. And I wish we had time. I really wish we had time. And, and at some point, this is we're probably going to unpack a lot more because what you're saying is brilliant. You, you're hearing all of this. And, and someone might go, well, what's this got to do with the mission of God? I'm like, well, so much. You know, it's it's turning to someone who asks that question about, well, you know, government's so corrupt. And, mm -hmm. and so therefore we should be disobedient and we should revolt. And, and it's like, no, hold on, hold on. Um, let's, let's walk through this text and let's see what Jesus says. Um, and then it actually comes to the question of, well, who do you belong to? Right. There's nothing here that is uh, hindering your faith. There's nothing here that's causing you to be disobedient to God, that's causing you to sin. Um, so it's a question of identity. Mm -hmm. Right. And we said uh, last week that uh, how you put God on display often has a way of showing itself how you understand your identity in him. And so if you're like, I belong to God, yeah. well, that's an opportunity to then throw that back at someone else and to say, well, who do you belong to? Who are you putting your trust in? Mm -hmm. uh, what are you, you hoping you'll get out of this? Mm -hmm. Mine is eternal. Yours is temporary if it is not in God. Mm -hmm. um, and so even when I think about the Roman Empire, yes, at that time, they were, you know, the most powerful nation uh, in all of the world. But before them, there were other nations that were powerful, right? We could talk about the Egyptians, um, we, we can, the Greeks, the Babylonians, we, we could talk about so many. And even after the Romans, uh, coming from Botswana, we were under the protectorate of uh, the British, which is similar to colonization, but not the same. And that's a whole other conversation. Um, but and, and there was a time where uh, Britain was the most powerful nation across the world. Like what I'm trying to say is that uh, all these empires come to an end. At some point, they come to an end. So, so who do you belong to? Do you want to belong to an empire that is temporary? Or do you want to belong to an empire that is eternal? Because mm -hmm. the church was back around back then. The church is still around today. Okay. And, and if I had money, if I had a million rands, 
I don't. I wish I did. But if I had a million rand, I would bet on the fact that the church will be here 50 years from now, 100 years from now. And so the question is, guys, that's what God is inviting you to be a part of. And so, so, so something that starts off with taxes, mm. man, now I'm talking to you about how you might put your hope in something that will last forever and that is only found in Jesus Christ. So mm. it's important that we, we understand the culture around us, but it's also important that we understand the word of God and see what Jesus does, which is quite unique. Mate, can I just reflect on that sure. real, real quick? So, um, oh man, I actually had a good reflection now. It's going to come back to me in just one second. I wanted to say something about politics, motives. It's just, a, let me say that first. Um, I think for us, if you think about, uh, you know, table conversations, if you think about social media conversations, if you think about, you know, queue in the post office conversation, when it has this really negative, inflammatory tone to it, about did you see what happened again? You know, when people say really, really hurtful things about individuals in the public space, like public figures and whatever, I'm, or, well, political figures, I'm always curious to know what is your loyalty towards them, you know, and why are you so extremely, extremely angry? Mm. And that's why I think Jesus points towards our motives and our loyalties. Mm. Um, if your testimony is, oh, I'm not too angry about this because I belong to someone else. Mm. Uh, and if your testimony is, well, I wasn't banking on that political party to give me the good life. So the fact that this political party is doing something that really isn't for the good of all people, uh, I, I can understand why. But my chips is not on them. You know, I didn't bet with them. I didn't put my loyalty with them to offer me the good life. Um, I remember now what I wanted to say. Your sermon about the posture of the ambassador and the title of ambassador. I think that's what was so helpful in the series. So an ambassador comes with a priority. Ambassador comes with motive. You know, ambassador comes with a loyalty to a different country. Mm. And I'm here to execute this for you. Mm. So even though everything around me might seem like absolute chaos, I'm going to stay single-minded, I'm going to be focused on what I'm supposed to do here. I think that's the best posture we can have mm. in this really choppy time. Mm. So good. So good. And like I said, I wish we had time. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close this off here, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw the ball back in your court and, mm -hmm. um, and, and say, hey, man, is any any last things that you'd want to say um, that you feel like are helpful to get our people to think more missional, to recognize that uh, we are on mission as the people of God? Um, and in there, maybe throw in one or two prayer requests uh, for your church plant. 2021, um, you know, the, the start of the new year, more information will come out in terms of date and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, but how can we collectively be praying uh, for what you believe God has laid on your heart? Yeah, awesome. Okay, so the first one, you said closing remarks on how we can be more missional. Uh, I think the power of story is something that has to get its time in the limelight in South Africa at this point of view, you know, okay, at this point in time. Um, you cannot argue the existence of my story. And you also cannot argue the existence of my testimony. And you can connect with my story and my testimony in various ways. So I think if we think evangelism, if we think sharing the good news, and we think about what God has done for us and how we tell that story, how we discovered him, how we keep on discovering him, what the joy is to be part of the church and to be part of community. That's the kind of stuff that we need to tell at this point in time. And once again, never dissing apologetics and you know uh, expounding the gospel and, and trying to uh, have people understand the key propositions of the Christian faith. I'm not against teaching. I mean, I am a teacher myself. Mm. But I think if we as people just think about our own story and then just tell that story and see what happens, mm. I think God can use that and give it some water and grow something phenomenal from it. You know, the story in John 9 always sticks with me of the blind person being healed. And then the, uh, uh, the Jewish council calls him in and asks him all these questions about Jesus and the validity of his healing. And then he goes, guys, I really don't know. And then they pull in his parents and they start questioning them. And then they throw out his parents and they call him back in. And then the whole story culminates in the scene where he says, I do not know the answer to all of your questions. Here's what I know. I was blind, but now I see. And that's what Jesus did for me. And I'm pretty sure that he can do the same for you. That would kick us into a whole new evangelism and missional gear. I think. Mm. Learning the art of conversation again, not tweeting the art of conversation, asking good questions, asking open-ended questions, learning the art of saying, thank you for sharing, 
I also felt like this at a certain point in time, and then kicking your story off there, you know, mm-hmm. or looking for an opportunity to say, you ask the question, uh, and I'm curious, do you actually want an answer on that, you know, uh, or to journey with someone in a journey of discovery, you know, mm-hmm. um, th- that would kick us into a whole different frame of mind, I think. So let me just leave that one there. Mm-hmm. I think the power of story mm-hmm. is where we should be at the moment. Mm-hmm. If you ask us uh, what you can pray for for our church plant, I think uh, three key things are on our minds at the moment. The first would be that we would be a praying church uh, and that we would really pray as we plant, pray as we share, pray as we gather, pray as we serve, pray as we manifest God's glory there. You know, really, that's so important for me. I've been part of the church for a really long time. And uh, prayer sometimes gets the back seat. And I think prayer should be the foundation to everything. So I know it sounds so lame. If you put this on a slide, it would look stupid. Pray that we pray. But I actually do mean that. Um, the second thing is, I think Centurion is hungry for this kind of evangelism, mm-hmm. for friendship evangelism, mm-hmm. for people asking questions and plugging into each other's stories. Uh, and I, I would really pray for our group to be zealous in sharing that. Mm-hmm. You know, Centurion has seen a lot of uh, tracts being handed out a lot of four spiritual laws, a lot of five-minute evangelism, uh, lots of elevator evangelisms, you know, quick prayer, and then we're done. Uh, I I don't think that's our strategy. We wouldn't have planted a church if that was our strategy, Mm -hmm. because our strategy is plant a church that is a visible manifestation of the thing that you are talking about, then talk to people about it and invite them into it. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's the best mission strategy at this point. And then the last thing is um, we we are gearing up to uh, answer the question in our group, who's going to do what, right? So you, you remember that phase. Yeah, it's so exciting. Like we need all of these gifts. We need all of these skills. We need all of these strengths. We need all of these things organized. I, but wait, we're part of a body, which means that there are gifts present here in this body, mm. given to the body to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Mm. So who's going to do what? So that's where we are now. And uh, I'm praying for, for, for the capacity of our people. I'm praying that we would be excited about who God has given to this group. Um, I mean, we sent out an invitation to two churches, which was Rooted Fellowship and PVR. And we said, listen, guys, this is a vision. If you guys want to join us, it would be phenomenal. God was gracious in sending us a really, really cool group of people, uh, well gifted with you know so much diversity. So uh, we're looking forward to formatting the team mm. so that we can launch early next year. Mm. And then I would say the last thing is just wisdom around when should we launch and how should we launch? You know, oh, are we going to have a lockdown in March? Mm. Are we going to launch for two Sundays and then be digital for six months? <laughs> I don't know. But what I do know is that God will give us wisdom. In that. Yeah. Great. Brother, thank you so much. Thank you for this time. Um, and, and we'll definitely be praying those those uh, for you and with you. Um, and, and so let me close with these words uh, that we find in the book of Philippians. Um, and I almost want to cover you and your team with them. Uh, it's just a reminder that we are kingdom citizens in an earthly reality. Right, So we don't belong here, but while we are here, we are to put on display the kingdom of God. And so uh, Paul writes this in Philippians. Uh, chapter 3 from verse 17. He says, Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine. Why would he say that? Well, it's because he's following Jesus. He's, he says, as, as I follow Jesus, follow me. That's essentially what he's saying. And learn from those who follow our example. For I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. There's so many people that say, I'm a Christian. But when you kind of look deeper, you actually realize you are far from what Jesus has called us to. And so he says, recognize that they are among you. Verse 19, they are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about their shameful things and they think only about this life here on earth. But we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we are eagerly waiting. And we know as Christians that our wait is an active one. Right? It's not a passive one. We don't just sit back. I got my ticket. I'm ready to go. No, as I wait, I'm on mission. Mm-hmm. Right. So he says, and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our savior. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own using the same power with which he will bring everything under his mm-hmm control. And so brother, those are my words for you. Those are uh, 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 my words for all of us uh, as we seek to be on mission for the glory of God. Let me pray real quick.
uh, and then we'll end our time. Father God, thank you so much for who you are. Uh, thank you for your word. Uh, it continues to work in our hearts. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would send us out, uh, that you would make us ambassadors of your kingdom, that you uh, would give us boldness and courage, that you would give us words to speak. Lord, I pray for Reino and Marie. I pray for the mayor family. I pray for the entire Fellowship City team. Lord, would you bless them? Would you even now open opportunities for them to share the good news uh, to to those who are poor, to those who are blind, to those who are captives and oppressed, uh, may they experience the fullness of the gospel. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. God is liefde, jij ons harte in bedenk
How incredible was that? That is a mission that we can all run with. A church that is about love, kindness, and humility. We as a church would like to put that into action. So if at this time you are one who is in need, I'd also to send an email through to community at rootedfellowship.com and the church will see how to best assist you in your time of need. Please remember to press like, to subscribe and hit the notification bell on this here YouTube channel. Remember to also follow us on all our social media platforms. We end all our services with a benediction. Benediction meaning a good word. So let us listen to what today's good word is. May Christ dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen. Enjoy the rest of your week. Bye.